Chris Davies. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. It's a pleasure to follow the Honourable Member for Enfield North, and I will be concentrating a lot of my remarks on employment, which is quite ironic given the collective industrial action that appears to be taking place in the Conservative benches. I just hope that the, I just hope that the, 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 the ballot was, was conducted in a, 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 in a legal way. But I am disappointed, Mr Deputy Speaker, that the Honourable Member for Ipswich I may be alone in this, but I'm, I'm disappointed that the Honourable Member for Ipswich is not in his place because um, the anti-immigration rhetoric he was using, yeah. Mr Deputy Speaker, as you were taking the chair, I think is in stark contrast to the reality of the situation. Now, because I do not believe, Mr Deputy Speaker, that any human being is illegal. And I think when we use words like illegal towards our fellow human beings, we're in dangerous ground and territory indeed. And what a stark contrast it is, Mr Deputy Speaker. I've been in tears of joy over the last few days. And it's not the Queen's speech, I can assure you. <laughs> it is, um, I'm delighted to say, the great news that we had in the Council elections. Now, as you know, Mr Deputy Speaker, the good people of Glasgow South West are among the most sophisticated electorate in these islands. And in the Greater Pollock Ward, they hit it out of the park because they have elected the great Rosa Sally, the first refugee elected as a councillor in Scotland. What a wonderful achievement that is for someone who, frankly, is a brilliant young woman, uh, as the uh, First Minister of Scotland said. This is someone who has served with distinction in the Glasgow South West constituency office. So good, she's been promoted twice, Mr Deputy Speaker, currently the office manager, and she has served uh, and helped serve constituents diligently. I believe she will be a fantastic councillor. But isn't it uh, something, when we hear the rhetoric from some of the government benches about immigrants and the anti-immigrant language, when you have a brilliant young woman uh, who is now serving uh, uh, and engaging in public service. And that is why, Mr Deputy Speaker, I want to see asylum seekers being given the right to work. Because I think this was a mistake that the Blair government put in place when they stopped asylum seekers having the right to work. I think it's absolutely scandalous that we allow asylum seekers to be living on the equivalent of what I was earning as a youth trainee with Strathclyde Regional Council 30 years ago. It is not right, and I think asylum seekers, after a period of time, maybe six months, should have the right to work and make their contribution Absolutely. in this economy. And I give way to my good friend from Middlesbrough. I'm, I'm very grateful, Donald Trump, for giving way. Um, he's absolutely right to focus on this issue. Uh, and, of course, the government's uh, scheme for the homes for Ukraine, uh, Ukrainian refugees uh, has a lot to recommend it, if it would only work properly for everybody. But at the heart of it, that ability for people to have recourse to public funds and the ability to work is absolutely the right one. But surely that should apply to every refugee. Why it shouldn't sink, simply be uh, uh, restricted to, to one particular country. And I'm gl delighted they have that. But shouldn't it go across the board universally? I do agree with that because I think that people who seek sanctuary in this country want to make a contribution. And they want to make a positive contribution to this uh, uh, across these islands. And so I, I do agree with the uh, Honourable Member for M M Middlesbrough uh, on that basis. There should be the right to work. And I'll give way to him. Yeah. I, I, thank, um, I thank him for giving way. Um, I, wanted to, uh, I want to associate myself with the comments he's made about his uh, office manager who's been elected to uh, Glasgow City Council, I believe. I was on a trade, trade union delegation, United delegation, with him many years ago, so know her well. Uh, the point he's making about refugees and asylum seekers, does he agree with me that the Home Office has serious issues when it comes to dealing with these people, and not just the current Home Secretary, but the former Home Secretary, former Prime Minister, is the architect of the hostile environment against people of colour, and Home Office has had long-standing issues under this Conservative government, and it needs a root and branch reform? Yes, I uh, th thank him very much for that, and I should, uh, if I hadn't already said that Rosa is indeed a Unite activist and former member of the STUC General Council, Scotland's Workers' Parliament as well, and uh, was indeed in Cuba with uh, the, the, the uh, honourable gentleman uh, uh, in a delegation. But he is absolutely right. The Home Office must be, I think, one of the most dysfunctional, and, and I know it's a competition, 
but the Home Office is probably one of the most dysfunctional government departments there is, and you only need to ask people who are looking for a passport at the moment uh, to, 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 to uh, ask that. Now, I very much associate myself with uh, the comments made by uh, my hon. Friend for Aberdeen North, who was quite right about the, the challenges around EU law and the EU workers' protections, because I had mentioned Strata Regional Council earlier. Uh, when the uh, Tory government decided to abolish Strata Regional Council, it was, I remember when Tupi was good legislation uh, and did a, a, a pr 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 protect workers on that basis. Now, I want to focus my remarks, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, on my first intervention to the uh, Parliamentary Under Secretary of State. And the fact that the government picked the Under Secretary of State to lead for the government on fairness at work, I think, uh, tells you a lot about the priorities. Now, many honourable members have talked about the promises in the employment bill. So I'm going to quote directly the Delegated Legislation Committee of the 25th of January, not a date that you can forget if you're Scottish. The 25th of January, Burns Day, at 10.46 a.m., the Under Secretary of State said, clearly the employment bill, as the honourable member for Glasgow South West knows, is primary legislation. It will be announced when it comes forward in Parliament time in the Queen's speech. So that is in well, Hansard, uh, Hansard is accurate, I believe. The record's not been corrected in any way. So that tells us, Mr Deputy Speaker, that an employment bill is not a priority for this government. And I want to know why it's not a priority for this government. Because as, as many uh, honourable me uh, members have said, um, and as, uh, as we hear regularly at the Department of Work and Pension Select Committee, the impact uh, uh, on women and, and BAME workers of unfair w working practices and indignities at work. And that starts with zero-hour contracts. We had the Parliamentary Under Secretary of State simultaneously telling us that zero-hour contracts are a good thing but are also exploitative. Well, they can't be both. M M M M Mr Deputy Speaker, and I think that I think we, we should perhaps take on this argument in the zero hour contracts are a good thing and people want them. So let's only allow them where there's a collective agreement with a recognised trade union, and then we'll find out how many people actually want zero hour contracts or not. No legislation for short term shift changes, as many honourable members have said, where people turn up to their work. Sometimes they're told, expecting they have a five-hour shift, to be told that they have to work ten hours that day. Or even worse, they turn up at their work and told that there are no hours for them to work that day and they have to pay out transport and childcare costs. So we really need legislation to tackle that and to make sure where that does happen, that it's double time for uh, workers uh, around those issues. No, uh, no protection where a company ceases trading. A, a good example we had uh, in uh, Scotland was a, a hairdresser uh, operating out of a hotel who then upped and left to Portugal, left the workers with no wages, and they had no protection at all because they went to the hotel and asked for wages, and the hotel said, not our responsibility. I want to see legislation to fix those sorts of issues because that is the reality of what's happening. And the pandemic amplified these issues. These issues didn't go away uh, with the pandemic. The pandemic uh, emphasised those issues, and I'm sure my, my friend from Middlesbrough will agree because we've proposed uh, uh, legislation similarly on this. We really need to sort out the status of workers in the country. There are far too many, I believe, workers who are bogusly self-employed. And that actually has the double hit of people being caught up in this loan charge scandal as well, because they, don't, they, they, they think that they're, they're directly employed and they're not. And frankly, you know, we were promised, I, I remember sitting here, the, the, the private members bill on fire and rehire, we were promised there would be a better way of doing it, and I don't see that either. I'll just uh, uh, conclude in two quick things, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, I am concerned at the government's uh, changes announced just before the end of the last session, which will make sanctions easier on benefit claimants. I think, that's going, uh, I think that's going the wrong way, and I also believe it's going against what the government had promised. The government had promised that they would start initiating warnings before they would sanction people, and we, uh, we were given commitments that that was going to be the case, 
and those commitments seem to have disappeared. And I'll, I'll give way. Can I thank my honourable friend for, for giving way and for, for the excellent speech that he is making right now? But on the, on the subject of sanctions, does he not agree with me that all the evidence shows that sanctions and conditionality do not actually work, especially when it pertains to disabled people? And frankly, this government should be seeking to actually scrapping the sanctions regime. Uh, yes. I do want to see the, the end of the uh, s s sanctions regime, and I agree that conditionality is not working. But I think, as a bare minimum, they could introduce a yellow, what, what's known as a yellow card or a warning system before someone is sanctioned, uh, and not people just turning up and being sanctioned because they were five minutes late. I mean, there are people who we, we're politicians; we're late for meetings all the time, aren't we? Because that's just the way the world works. That, that we're late, you know. So, would we be sanctioned for being five minutes late? I don't think so. I want to join others, uh, well, lastly, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, in supporting the principle of freedom of peaceful assembly. And, in the year, uh, and uh, it was a year ago that, that fellow Glaswegians, along with myself, were on Kenmuir Street to stop the Home Office uh, from taking away two people in an immigration van. And, it, and, I, and I congratulate the good people of Edinburgh for uh, stopping a, a, an immigration raid uh, last week. The principle of people being able to assemble freely and peacefully must remain in these islands, as far as I'm concerned. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, I support and join with my friend in Aberdeen North. We need employment law devolved to the Scottish Parliament, where this government will not act, because if it will not act, the people of Scotland, when they get a choice and they look at employment law, will choose independence over them any day of the week. Barry Gardner. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.